Hello, everyone. My name is Yulin, and I'm an accountant. For a good uh, proportion of my professional career, I was a financial auditor. But uh, a few years ago, I pivoted to something else. So nowadays, when people ask me, Yulin, what is it that you do? Uh? That's it. I'm in sustainability and climate change. Then they ask me, how is it that you can become from accountant to become in climate change? Then also they ask me this question, what do accountants have to do with climate change? Well, I'll answer that question in a bit. But first, I wanted to take you to this year, about 500 years ago, 1494. Now, this year is pretty special. It was the period of the Italian Renaissance. So there was uh, art and also commerce booming in Italy. And there was a man, a Franciscan friar, a mathematician called Luca Pacioli. So Luca Pacioli was a mathematician. And uh, he created and published this very important book called The Summary of Arithmetic, Geometry, Proportions, proportionality. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's actually a very important book. It's so important because it actually helped to establish the principles of accounting, particularly around debits and credits. Many people have said that it's because of these principles that trade, commerce continued to develop. So maybe let me give you an example. Why are these principles so important? Say you are an investor, okay? You want to have a look at a company on whether or not to invest. And you say, let me have a look at those financial information, the financial statements. So you get the financial statements and you turn to the balance sheet and you say, hmm, pretty healthy balance sheet. You turn to the P&L and say, lots of profits as well. I'll invest in this company. So these financial information actually engenders trust and accountability. And it's these principles that have been used by accountants that have been actually also relied on by investors and also stakeholders that engendered trust and accountability. Now, I want to move on to another topic. Something that is, I think, close to everybody's heart in this audience today. Something that affects all of us, your families, your future families, investors, companies as well. And something that I feel, now that I'm in this space, we haven't properly accounted for. And we also haven't been felt accountable to. And guess what that, what that the issue is? Climate change. I want to now dish out three numbers and also three letters. 418 ppm. What is 418 ppm? So firstly, PPM stands for parts per million. And that's a measure of the concentration in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 418 is the level of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it's not a good level. Let me tell you why. So as far as we could actually record the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we could go back a pretty long time, I'm quite surprised, 800,000 years. The carbon dioxide has always oscillated between 200 and 300 parts per million, never above 300. And the changes in the oscillation of carbon dioxide over 200 to 300 ppm, it occurred over tens and thousands of years. So very long time frames, and the Earth could adapt accordingly, naturally. But something happened. About 100 plus years ago, pre-industrialization happened. And our parts per million managed to actually go through the 300 ppm level and smash through 400 ppm. So we are here at 418 ppm. And some might ask, like, what's the big deal? It's just a number. Some of you may know that greenhouse gas emissions actually traps heat in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, that increases 
the surface temperature of Earth. So some ask me, so exactly how much has the temperature increased from pre-industrial levels? I'll show you a number. 1.1 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels. People always ask me, actually that is quite trivial. Why, what's the big deal about 1.1 degrees Celsius? Actually, people are already feeling the effects of climate change even at this level. I'll share with you two other numbers. 1.5 and two degrees Celsius. Scientists always talk about these two numbers, 1.5 and two. People always tell me, what's the big deal? What's the difference? And I say, actually, there's a world of difference. Scientists say that in the 1.5 degrees Celsius world, 70 to 90% of our coral reefs will vanish. And in a two degrees Celsius world, 99%. And another case in point, in the 1.5 degrees Celsius world, we talked about wheat production decreasing by 7%. And in the 2 degrees Celsius world, that will increase to 16% reduction in wheat production in the tropics. Scientists are also saying that in the 2 degrees Celsius world, there will be more heat waves and extreme weather events as well. So scientists are saying, please, try to keep it at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now that we understand why it is important to cap that increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, people often ask me, so how much of this carbon dioxide is there in the atmosphere? How much of it? And I said, to understand this, let me show you this picture. So this picture here is a orange ball but it's a very special orange ball. It's actually a very big orange ball, probably larger than this or taller than this stage. It's two stories high, and it represents one ton of CO2. People ask me, so how much of these orange balls, if it represents one ton of CO2, are there in the atmosphere? I'll give you another number. 51 gigatons, which actually translates to 51 billion of these balls in the atmosphere being emitted every year. Scientists say, if you want to keep within a 1.5 degree scenario, you can, but you need to half those emissions by a time frame, 2030, which is eight to nine years time, and then you need to get it to zero by 2050. You might think, so is this very tough or what? Well, based on the study by PwC of the G20 countries, which is the largest countries in the world, you need to decarbonize by 11.7% a year to get to that 1.5 degree scenario. So you say, actually quite doable. Maybe we can get there. But I'll give you a reference point. Last year, 2020, was the year where COVID was raging. Lots of business stopped. We had the circuit breaker. We had lockdowns. Activities decreased. Planes or airports shut down. Hazard a guess about the decrease of carbon emissions during the year of 2020. Hazard a guess. Close? Not close, sorry. It was, unfortunately, only 7%. Some sources even say 6%. When I saw this number, I said to myself, oh my goodness, despite all this reduction in terms of activities, we only decrease our carbon emissions around the world by 6 to 7%. How are we going to decarbonize the whole world henceforth? But you know something? There are three areas that actually give me hope. Let me share with you. The first area is technology and innovation. My first ball of hope, including innovation in sustainable finance. And there's a really great innovation that's happening with renewable energy. And even in geoengineering, like carbon capture. The next area of hope, I think, is nature-based solutions. 
using inland forests and mangroves to sequester the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And last but not least, the third one, which I think is us, the community, businesses, governments, individuals, setting ambitious targets, coming together to confront and to fight climate change. You know, during 2020, I thought there was a lot of issues in the world. COVID was raging. And I thought, you know, I think climate change will be in the back burner. But I was very surprised. In 2020, the number of companies and also the number of countries that actually committed to net zero had doubled from 2019. You had Japan, New Zealand, South Korea, China, all saying that they would be carbon neutral. And then, just this year, you have the US that said they will slash their carbon emissions by half by 2030. I think this is good news. We also talked about investors. Investors as well are very interested in companies who are climate and ESG resilient. So the ambition is there. I think there's lots of work to do. So how is it that we can keep companies, organizations accountable and decrease the carbon emissions? Just now I talked about financial information. Actually, the financial information world is actually a very well uh, taken and also a very clear path, very well traveled path. However, in the ESG area or the climate area, the path is less well traveled and also it's foggy. Let me explain why. Well, firstly, there are quite a number of sustainability and climate related standards around. So people will use different, different organizations would use different standards. This is actually makes it very difficult for stakeholders and also investors to cast and compare. It can be confusing. The next area is about carbon footprinting or carbon measurement. Well, to be honest, I don't think all companies actually know what is their carbon footprint. And even if they're measuring the carbon footprint, they're not measuring it completely. There are no complete boundaries. There's also no complete measurement of their scopes as well. So how do you actually then baseline your carbon emissions, set meaningful targets to actually decarbonize? You can't do it. It just surprises me that in an area where trust and accountability is most needed, in the climate and ESG area, that there's not much of it. So when people ask me, Yulin, who do you think can help in this? What do you think we can do? And I say, actually, I think accountants can help in this. I think accountants are able to fight climate change. They can save the world. And then people say, Yulin, you're mad. I say, yeah, I think accountants can be mad. I think accountants can be mad for climate change. And let me tell you why. Firstly, measurement and disclosure. Accountants have been doing this for hundreds of years. They have been great at measurement and accounting and also disclosures. This is going to be a very natural adjacency for accountants. Actually, if you look at the greenhouse gas protocol, it does have quite a number of accounting principles hidden within as well. The next area is adding credibility. Accountants, like auditors, have been verifying financial and non-financial information for the longest time too. Say for example, you wanted to buy some high quality carbon offsets, a quantity of it. Wouldn't you want to know that the amount that you bought is indeed high quality carbon offsets? Accountants can play a part in that too. And last but not least, is driving change. And accountants are already doing so. In the world of global governance, the International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS, the trustees, have come out to say that they will make a start in making a combined or harmonized reporting standards of sustainability. So you see, 
accountants can play a part. They can drive change. And on an everyday basis, I'm also seeing accountants putting up their hand, young accountants putting up their hand and say, I want to join this fight. I want to join this fight against climate change. And I will use my skills and experience to fight this. So I guess to answer that question, these are some ways that accountants can help to fight climate change. You know, I think our world can be very different in the future. In the future, we might not hear the roaring sounds of internal combustion engines, but we will hear the humming sounds of electric vehicles. In the future, we won't see forest fires, red skies, but we'll see clear blue skies with air that we can breathe. In the future, our energy sources won't be reliant on fossil fuels. Those things need to be kept in the ground where they belong. Instead, our energy sources will come from the sun. It will come from the wind. And it will come from gushing waters. In the future, everybody will have a right to a good education from the start so that they can realize their dreams. So, isn't this a future worth fighting for? Isn't this a future worth fighting for in every role that we undertake? Whether or not we are an educator, whether or not we are a young person, whether or not we are a mother, a CEO, a chief sustainability officer, a banker, whether or not we are an accountant. Thank you very much.